Welcome to the second session in the series of preparing for Ramadan and being excited for Ramadan by Allah's permission. We're going to take today some fundamental and important issues pertaining to the fiqh, the regulations of Ramadan. We're going to take this from the book known as Umdat al-Fiqh from the famous Imam Ibn Qudama al-Maqtasi rahmatullah alayhi and um, the book is guidance for beginners at a beginner level and that's good for us because we in reality are beginners and this leads me in, into an important point which is that when we study fiqh there are many different opinions out there and there's lots of information and it's tempting as beginners to want to try and grab a hold of as much information as you can and to at times be self-deluded and to think that you can decipher the variety of opinions but this is an absolutely incorrect way to proceed as a beginning student of knowledge because the prerequisite tools that are required for us to be able to delve into the higher texts and to be able to look through the variety of opinions and to decide which is a stronger opinion which is a weaker opinion that takes a long time to develop so our reality is like we are at best we are GCSC level students when it comes to fiqh so it makes no sense whatsoever when studying fiqh at a GCSE level to take a degree level course or a PhD level course which is where you would look at the differences of opinions etc so I say this not to belittle anybody not to belittle myself or anybody who's listening but rather for us to have a reality of our situation so that we don't waste time and get lost in, a, in so much information that we collect yet we understand very little of it Whereas the, the reality of seeking knowledge is a tadarruj, to do it step by step. You take the fundamentals and then you build upon those fundamentals bit by bit, understanding them, conceptualizing them, memorizing them, and then bit by bit you add to that. So this is the correct way to go and it's an incorrect way to go, is to delve into too much information in the beginning. So that's just an introductory point that scholars, they generally put out there for the students of knowledge when they are studying any type of fiqh so as the student doesn't delude himself or herself and is able to stick to a, to a basic curriculum until they grasp that and then they can move on incremental, incrementally to the next steps so the author, may Allah have mercy upon him he entitles this part of the book his book, Amdat al-Fiqh Kitab uh, al-Suyam, the book of fasting so Suyam, fasting has a linguistic meaning what is the linguistic meaning, Lughatan, of fasting? Lughatan, linguistically, fasting means al-imsak, al-imsak, which means to refrain and to withhold back from something or a variety of things. So in Surah Al-Maryam, for example, you have the statement of Maryam alayhi salam, where she said, إِنِّي نَذَّرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ صَوْمًا فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْسِيًّا That today I have vowed a sawm, sawm from the uh, word suyam. I have vowed a psalm to Allah, so I won't speak to anybody today. So she was refraining from speech, and it was given the term psalm. So from this, the ulama, the scholars, they took linguistically that fasting, it means to refrain. Because here in the verse, she's refraining from speaking. So suyam, psalm, these meanings, these words, they have the meaning linguistically of refraining. Istilahan, this word istilahan means technically. What does it mean technically to fast Ramadan or any other fast? The fasting of Ramadan technically is as follows. Imsak maqsus and asha'i maqsusa fi waqtin maqsus min shakhsin maqsus. Okay, so break it down step by step. Imsak maqsus. It's a specific withholding, a specific refraining. An asha'i maqsusa from specific things. So a specific refraining from specific things fi waqtin maqsus in a specific time min shaqsin maqsus from a specific person. So this is the general definition given to us in the uh, Sharia technically for what is fasting and these things will become clear to us. The specific fasting that it's the fasting of Ramadan Fasting from specific things, meaning the things that will break your fast if you take them in a specific time, meaning from dawn to dusk in the month of Ramadan. 
from a specific person, meaning the Muslim who fulfills certain conditions. And we'll take each one of these in more detail as we go through the course, the lessons that we are doing. Fasting in of Ramadan was made obligatory in the second year of the Hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, the second year of the migration of the Prophet وسلم, when he migrated to Medina وسلم, in the second year fasting was made obligatory upon the Muslims the author he says Ramadan, that the fasting of Ramadan is obligatory and this is one of the pillars of Islam that we know that it's obligatory because it's one of the pillars of Islam in the famous hadith of Ibn Umar anhum he said that the Prophet وسلم, said, Bunya Islam ala khams, shahadati an la ilaha illallah, wa an la muhammad rasulullah, wa iqam salah, wa ita'i zakah, wa hajj, wa salmi ramadan. That the Prophet وسلم, said that Islam has been built upon five foundations. These foundations must be there for one to be a Muslim, right? Built upon the five foundations, which is to testify that none has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that Muhammad is his final messenger and his slave and to establish the prayer in the way that it should be established, to give the zakah, the obligatory charity, and to make the pilgrimage to the Hajj once in a lifetime, if one is able to do so, and to fast the Ramadan. So this hadith establishes for us that fasting is obligatory. And we know this, of course, because we took it previously in last week's lesson where we spoke about the verse, Kutiba uh, alaykum usiyam, that, ver that uh, fasting has been made obligatory upon you. The author he says, Ala kulli Muslim. Who is it obligatory upon? It's obligatory upon every Muslim. So anybody who's a Muslim has to fast. Of course, there's further, uh, there's further descriptions of this, further restrictions that we're going to discuss. But in general, any Muslim has to fast. So two points here to mention that if one becomes a Muslim in Ramadan, after the sun has set in any of the days of Ramadan. So somebody becomes a Muslim, a new Muslim, in the month of Ramadan, after the sun has set in Ramadan. So this person, they do not have to make up anything which was before they became a Muslim from the fasting of the month of Ramadan, but they have to now start to fast that which is in front of them from the rest of the month of Ramadan, okay? So they do not have to make up that which passed before they were Muslim, in the month of Ramadan, but they have to make up what is left and in front of them from the month of Ramadan. Secondly, if one becomes a Muslim before the sunset on a given day in Ramadan, then what they have to do is they have to withhold, even though they may not have started the day fasting because they weren't Muslim at that point, but at whatever point in a day before sunset on Ramadan they become a Muslim, they have to then withhold like the other Muslims are doing till the sun has set, and then that particular day they will have to make it up as well as the other days they continue fasting in the month of Ramadan. The author he said, and the person has to be balikh. So the person for it to be obligatory upon them is that they are Muslim and also that they are balikh. Balikh, this term, it means that the person has reached the age of maturity wherein now the obligations are, or have become incumbent and obligatory upon this person, whether male or female. So Balik is a stage that you reach in your life and age wherein it becomes obligatory upon you now to fulfill the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set out for us in Islam. So we have the hadith in Ibn Majah, collected by Imam Ibn Majah, where the Prophet said, that the pen has been lifted from three, meaning that the pen of decree, the pen of responsibility, that until these three things happen or um, if these three things are not there, you are not responsible for your actions, you're not going to be taken to account. So the Prophet ﷺ said, the pen has been lifted from three, from the one who is sleeping until he wakes up, and from the one who is small, below the age of being baligh, until they reach the age of being baligh. And from the one who has lost their um, mental faculties, until those mental faculties return to them. Maybe they're unconscious or they've um, slipped into a state of uh, mental faculty loss. So until they return to the state of being able to think correctly, then the pen of, the, the pen of responsibility of writing down what they do in terms of rewards or punishments from them is removed. So the author is telling us that not only do you have to be a Muslim, you also have to be baligh. 
that you have to reach that age wherein things are now obligatory upon you and you are going to be held to account for these things. So in order for somebody to be balugh, there are four signs. There are four signs uh, or four matters that one has to consider for a person to be balugh. Does anybody know, this is a question to yourselves, the host can un unmute you if you put, raise your hands. Does anybody know what these matters are? That how is it determined that a person has reached the age of balugh? There are three matters that men and women share and there's a fourth matter specifically for the women. Does anybody have the answer to this question? How do we know that somebody has reached the age of being balugh? So somebody mentioned start of period, that's fantastic, very well done. That's specifically to the women, that once a woman she starts her menstruation, or then she has now reached the age of Balugh, okay? And with regards to the ones which are shared between the men and women, it's if you reach the age of 15, you are Balugh, or you have the pubic hair, which comes out on the body, you are considered as being Balugh, or you emit semen, uh, whether that's for the male or the women, then you become Berlin. So there's four matters altogether, right? You reach the age of Belug with these four matters. The, the one which is specific only to the sisters is menstruation. Then it's the age of 15, or somebody has pubic hair, or semen is emitted. Any one of these four matters, whichever of them come first, then the person is determined as now being at the age of Belug, Berlin. Um, the author, he also says aqil, that the person has to be aqil, meaning that the person has to have their mental faculties about them. And then he says qadir ala sawm, that the person has to have the ability to fast. So not only is the person a Muslim, and they've reached the age of balugh, they also have to have, have, be aqil, they have their mental faculties about them, and also qadir ala sawm, that they have to have the ability to fast. So for example, the one who is very sick, or the one who is very old and feeble, these people, they do not have to fast as also there are other categories that we will mention a bit later on, inshallah. The author, he said, The young child is commanded to fast as a recommendation. It, the young child is commanded to fast uh, if they are able to deal with the fast. If they are strong enough to fast, then they are commanded to fast, even though they haven't yet reached the age of Balugh. They haven't read for example, they haven't reached the age of 15 or the age where their uh, pubic hairs have come out upon them. Why is this the case? Why do we start them off with fasting at a young age? Every culture or every way of life that has things which are important to them, they are taught from a young age. The seeds of that belief or that way of life or those mannerisms or those ethos, those ethics are taught from an early age. And this is very important with regards to the Muslim and their belief that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe in certain beliefs and acts of worship which we know to be true and we know to be beneficial for us in this life and the next life. So if that be the case, we want to start our children off believing in them and practicing them from an early age, right? Even if it be that they can't complete the fast, they do half of it or a third of it, this is a way of nurturing them upon fasting. So when they start off from a young age and they see the community and the household worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they themselves will want to partake in this worship. They themselves will be excited about this worship and they will grow up upon this worship and they won't ever complain or they won't have issues about practicing this worship when they get older. But the mistake that many Muslim families make, they allow the kids to do whatever they want to do and then when they reach the age of 15 or before that, the age of Balugh, they think that they can just flip a switch and all of a sudden the children will be practicing. This is not the case. Input has to be given from a very young age with love and care and excitement, giving prizes and gifts, etc. And the input has to be there from a young age so that the child can grow up uh, wanting to worship Allah so just based upon knowledge, excitement, and because they know that this is part of their uh, this is part of their being, this is part of their character, and it's uh, part of who they are. The author he says, the fasting of Ramadan becomes obligatory upon the ones that the author mentioned, that the person is Muslim, that the person reaches the age of Balugh, that the person has their aql about them, their mental uh, faculties, وقادر, and that the person has the ability to fast. Okay, so it becomes obligatory upon these people, the month of Ramadan, 
with one of three things. He says Kamal al-Sha'ban, that the month of Sha'ban, the month before Ramadan, is completed. In Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith for Abu Huraira, Rabbi Allahu Anhu, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yatihi fa in ghubi alaykum fa akmilu iddata sha'ban thalatheen. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, fast when you see the moon and break your fast, meaning start the Eid when you see your moon, the end of the month of Ramadan, when you see the moon. And if it is hidden from you, if the moon is hidden from you for whatever reason, fa akmilu iddata sha'ban thalatheen. Then complete the month of sha'ban 30 days. So if the month of Sha'ban has been completed 30 days, then that lets us know that the month of Ramadan is now going to start. The second way that we can know that uh, Ramadan has come upon us is Ru'yatul Hilal Ramadan, is to see the, the moon of Ramadan. Okay, so man shahida minkum mushahara fal yasumhu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, whoever from amongst you sees the moon, then let him fast. And we just mentioned in the hadith, the Prophet said, Sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yatihi. Fast when you see the moon and end your fast when you see the moon, meaning at the end of the month of Ramadan before Shawwal. So if the moon of Ramadan is seen, then of course the next day is going to be the first of Ramadan. We are allowed to use telescopes to spot the moon, okay? And if we're in a situation where it's a cloudy or dusty day to the extent that there's so much cloud in the sky that we can't see the moon with the naked eye, even if we mean via binoculars or a telescope, that doesn't now mean that we can use something like a drone with the camera. We send a drone with a camera up and above the clouds to try to spot the moon. Because this, as mentioned by Sheikh Abdul Salam al shawair in his explanation of Zad al-Mustaqni, he said this is a tanatta, this is going to extremes and making things difficult upon yourself because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only made it upon us that we have to sight the moon with our naked eye right if you sight the moon with your eye even if it be with a binoculars then that is well and fine but above and beyond that we don't need to do so and also we should avoid using the calculations because the Prophet mentioned this in one of the hadith that we don't calculate using lunar calculations or other type of calculations and also, seeing the moon, sighting the moon is something which is very simple. Uh, anyone can do it wherever they are in the world, based up, and it doesn't matter how educated they are, or if they have knowledge of uh, determining the, the sighting of uh, the stages of the moon or not. As long as they are able to see, they can determine whether the month has started or not. So this is the first way, the second way of knowing that Ramadan has now come upon us. The first was the 30 days of Sha'ban being completed, the month before Ramadan. The second way is that we see the moon of Ramadan. And then the third way is what we're going to mention now. The author says, If it's a case that on the 30th night of um, Sha'ban, the, the month before Ramadan, the 30th night, right, the night comes before the day, so the people, they go out to look for the moon and they have realized that the sky is covered in clouds or the sky is covered in deep, thick dust to the extent that they can't see the moon. So the ulama, they say in this situation that the people, they fast the next day as the first of Ramadan, even though they didn't see the moon and even though the 30 days of Sha'ban have not yet been completed. So on the 30th day of Sha'ban, because you, you checked in the night and you couldn't see the, um, the moon due to it being covered by clouds or covered by dust. So when that situation arises where the, the, the moon is possibly covered by clouds or dust on the 30th night of Sha'ban, then the next day is held to be the first of Ramadan, ihtiyatan, out of possibility and out of care for not missing a day from the month of Ramadan. And this day is known as Yom al ghaim Yom al ghaim okay? The first of Ramadan in this situation, where the moon was not able to be spotted on the 30th night of Sha'ban, due to the fact that the, cloud was, uh, the, the sky was cloudy or full of dust, then this, the next day is going to be fasted out of care and possibility that it could be Ramadan and it's known as Yom al ghaim And this was the fatwa that was given by many of the senior companions such as Aisha radiallahu anha, Abu Bakr al-Sadir, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhuma ajma'in. 
Sorry, not Abu Bakr Siddiq, Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu and others. And also we have in Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Umar radiyallahu anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu said, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهُ فَصُونُوا وَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهُ فَأَفْطِرُوا فَإِنَّ غُبَّ فَإِنَّ غُمِّيَ عَلَيْكُمْ فَإِنَّ غُمَّ عَلَيْكُمْ فَقَدِرُوا لَهُ The Prophet sallallahu said, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهُ فَصُونُوا When you see the moon, then fast. وَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهُ فَأَفْطِرُوا And when you see the moon, break the fast, meaning end the month. فَإِنَّ غُمَّ عَلَيْكُمْ فَقَدِرُوا لَهُ And if it is hidden from you due to the clouds or thick dust, then make تَقَدِيرُ of it. The hadith, the hadith said, فَقَدِرُوا لَهُ Which means تَقَدِير and تَقَدِير can mean linguistically make an estimation of it. However, the ulama that hold this opinion, which I'm explaining to you, they say فَقْدِرُوا تَقْدِيرُ here, it means to restrict the month, right? You restrict the month of Sha'ban to 29 days instead of 30 days. Why? Because it's in Surah Al-Talaq, in the following verse, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ فَلْيُنْفِقْ مِمَّا آتَاهُ اللَّهُ Then, whoever قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ whoever's provisions are restricted for him, then let him spend from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him, meaning let him spend from his means. So the, the word Qudira in this verse in the Quran, it means restricted. And it's the same word, but in a different format, which we mentioned in the hadith. فَقْدِرُوا Okay, so they took the meaning to mean restrict. So they say in the situation where the, where the moon is not able to be seen due to clouds, on the 30th night of Sha'ban, then we restrict uh, the month to 29 days and we take the next day to be the first of Ramadan. And this is known as Yawm al Ghaim. The author he says, If a person happens to be in a situation where they see the moon by themselves, they should go ahead and fast. Okay? Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ شَهْرٍ فَلْيَصُونَ uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, whomsoever from amongst you sees the moon, then they shall go ahead and fast. But in reality, what does this situation mean? Does it mean that every person who sees the moon by themselves, they go ahead and fast? No. It means, so those who are living in the Muslim country, if they have seen the moon, they go to the, the court which is established to check the testimony of the ones who have seen the moon. So in a situation when a person goes to give his or her testimony that they have seen the moon of Ramadan, and for whatever reason that testimony may be rejected, in this situation, the person has to fast, even if the testimony has been rejected. So it could be the case that this person saw the moon, they're for sure, they know that they saw the moon, but for whatever reason, the, the testimony is rejected by the courts, and the people won't start fasting on the same day as him. He, because he saw the moon by himself, he has to fast that day, the next day, okay? even if the people do not fast with him because the testimony was rejected. Why is that the case? Because the, the verse that we just read, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ شَهْرَ فَلْيَسُونَ That whoever from amongst you sees the, the, the moon of the month of Ramadan, they should fast. So it's directed to anybody who sees the moon. However, the scholars, they say, that this person now who is fasting because they saw the moon, they shouldn't go around telling people because that will cause confusion in society, that would cause confusion in the community, right? That he goes around telling people, I'm fasting, why aren't you people fasting? I saw the moon, etc, etc. Because the reality is that in the Muslim country, it's dealt by a government court, which is established to determine uh, whether or not the moon was uh, saw, or the moon was seen or not seen. The author he says, فَإِنْ كَانَ عَدْلًا صَامَ النَّاسُ بِقَوْلِ If the person was adlan, if the person was a Muslim, the person was a just person, the person was not a person that was openly falling into major sins, and the person had the ability to see so these four things, that the person, whether male or female, is a Muslim, the person is just, known to be just, the person is not known to fall, fall into major sins openly, right? As for hidden sins, we don't care, we don't know about the hidden sins. And the person is able to see, they have good eyesight, then this person's testimony should be accepted and not rejected. And the author said, people should fast according to his uh, testimony. Simon Nas bi Right? Why? Because the hadith of 
Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu in Abi Dawood, where Ibn Umar, this great companion, he said, Tara al-Nasu al-Hilal, fara'aytu, fa'akhbatu al-Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inni ra'aytuhu, fa'sama bihi wa amara al-Nasu bu'silamihi. That Ibn Umar, he said, I saw, I went out on the night, on the 30th of Sha'ban, the night when people were looking for the moon. And he said, I saw the moon. So I informed the Prophet ﷺ about that. So the Prophet ﷺ fasted based upon my testimony. And he told the people to also fast based upon my testimony. So if one person sees the moon, wherever that person is, and that person's testimony has been accepted by the authority, okay, then not only does that person have to fast, but the whole of the community has to fast. In fact, the majority of the scholars of Islam they said the whole of the Muslim Ummah, wherever they be, have to fast based upon that one testimony. So if any person in a Muslim land sees the moon and it is accepted by the, the established court of that government of that land, then not only do the people of that country have to fast, but everybody elsewhere on the globe have to fast based upon that one testimony. Now this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars. However, there is another opinion that uh, each country or each region can have their own sighting and also if it's the case that like many people they don't live in a Muslim country and there's, they don't have a governing body for them to determine when Ramadan starts or not so you will find a group of people will be starting with Saudi Arabia a group will start with Morocco a group will start with Pakistan etc uh, this shouldn't cause um, any kind of confusion in the community nor should it cause each other to debate and be upset with each other. Rather, what you should try and do is to try to go with the majority of that community, which is in a, a non-Muslim land. And if it be the case that people want to differ, they should differ with easy hearts. They should differ in a way where they don't hate each other for that different. Okay, they discuss with, with, with each other, they can debate with each other. But once the debate and discussion has taken place, they move on happily, continue to love one another for the sake of Allah, because Allah doesn't want us to hate each other over these differences of opinions. Okay? The author says, وَلَا يُفْتِرُوا إِلَّا بِشَهَادَةِ أَدْلٍ So the author previously, he told us that the fasting of Ramadan is started by the fasting, even if it's only the witness of one person. If, if the witness of one person is established, whether uh, male or female, with the conditions that I mentioned, then that witness is enough for the whole of the Ummah to fast. But now he's saying to us that with regards to the end of the month of Ramadan, ending the month of Ramadan, and entering into the month of Shawwal, لا يفتروا إلا بالشهادة عدلين Then the, the month of Shawwal is not determined unless two people have seen the moon of Shawwal. And Imam Ibn Abd al-Bar, may Allah have mercy upon him, the great Imam, the great uh, Maliki scholar, he said, أما شهادة على رؤية الهلال فأجمع للماء and he mentioned this in his book, at tamheed This great Imam, he mentioned that there is a consensus from the ulama and ijma that with regards to other than the month of Ramadan starting and specifically the month of Shawwal, the month which is after Ramadan, that this can only be determined to have started if two people see the moon, not one person. So one person seeing the moon is only for the month of Ramadan. All other months, they are require a witness of two people. The author, he said, وَلَا يُفْتِرُوا إِذَا رَآهُ وَحْدَهُ If a person sees the month of sh the moon of Shawwal by himself or herself, they are not allowed to break the month of Ramadan. They're not allowed to bring the month of Ramadan to an end. They can only do so upon the witnessing of the moon by two people. Okay? وَإِنْ صَامُوا بِشَهَادَةِ إِثْنَيْنْ ثَلَاثِينْ يَوْمًا أَفْتَرُوا The author, he says, if the month of Ramadan, however, was seen, it was started by the witness of more than one person, it was started by the witness of two people, and they have now completed 30 days of the month of Ramadan, then they can go ahead and now bring the month of Ramadan to a close and start the month of Shawwal. Why? Because in the hadith, collected by Imam ibn Sa'i wa Abd al-Rahman ibn Zayd ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhum an ashab al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal fa in shahida shahidani fa sumu wa aftiru that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said uh, that if two people saw the moon 
then uh, fast and break your fast. You need to start the month of Ramadan and you can end the month of Ramadan once it's been completed, right? So if two people were witnesses to the beginning of the month of Ramadan and 30 days have passed for Ramadan, then as soon as 30 days has passed, the next month of Shawwal comes into play. The author says, وَإِنْ كَانَ بِغَيْمِ The author is saying now, however, if the month of Ramadan started due to Ghaim, remember I was giving you the long explanation of what is known as Yawm al Ghaim, the day wherein Ramadan was started because the night before when the people were looking for the moon, they couldn't see it, the 30th night of, uh, of um, Sha'ban, they couldn't see the, the moon due to the clouds or due to uh, thick dust. So the next day was fasted out of ihtiyat, out of care and possibility that it could be Ramadan. So if this was the case that the month was started like that, the month of Ramadan was started like that, or it was started oh, or it was due to the witnessing of one person of the moon of Ramadan, lam yuftiru, then the, pe the people, they do not break Ramadan, they do not end Ram Ramadan, illa an yarahu, until the moon of Shawwal has been seen. So this means that you could end up fasting 31 days in Ramadan, and what would happen is that that day, the first day, the Yawm al ghaim which was fasted out of possibility of it being Ramadan, that would now become obsolete and would be treated as a mistake. And also the case of the person, uh, if we started Ramadan by the witness of just one person, we could say that maybe that person was mistaken. Because as of now, we haven't seen, we, we fasted 30 days and we haven't seen the next moon of Shawwal. So we're going to consider that first day as being obsolete, as being a mistake. And we're going to, in fact, all together fast 31 days. So the first day is a mistake, and the other 30 days are going to be the fast of Ramadan. The author says, If it's a situation where may Allah preserve the Muslims and protect them, that a Muslim prisoner is in a situation where they are locked up in a dungeon, in a cell, unable to know what's going out in the outside world and sadly this is the case of many millions of Muslims where Allah freed them that they are locked up unjustly like this if it's the case that a Muslim is in this situation then they don't know what's going on in the outside world they don't have access to information of has Ramadan started or not Taharra, the author he said Taharra Taharra is that they exert the best of their ability to try to determine based upon whatever calculations they can make okay uh, has Ramadan started or not? Wasam, and then the person goes ahead and fasts. If the person's fasting uh, happened to be in Ramadan or after Ramadan, okay, then the person's fasting is going to be fine. Meaning that if the person fasted in Ramadan or he ended up fasting after Ramadan, then the person's fasting is going to be fine. However, if the person ended up fasting before Ramadan, then the fasting is not going to be valid. طيب. So this, what we just mentioned, has four scenarios. The first of them, that fast, a person fasts before Ramadan. This person's fasting is not going to be accepted. Why? Question to yourselves. Why is this person's fasting not going to be accepted? So a person who sees, who, who's unable to see the moon in the explanation we're giving, and they, they exerted their effort to the best of their ability and they started fasting. And later on they found out that actually they started fasting before the month had started. Obviously their fasting is not going to be valid because it's before the sabbat, before the reason for the obligation. The reason for the obligation is the beginning of Ramadan. So without that there, then the fasting is not going to be valid. The second situation is that the person fasts after the Ramadan. The person ended up fasting after the month of Ramadan, like in Shawwal, for example. This person's fast is going to be accepted. Why? Because it's given the analogy, it's given the Qiyas, the analogy of one who has qada in their prayers, right? They have prayers which had to be made up. They had a legitimate excuse not to pray on time, so they had to pray their prayer outside of the time due to a legitimate, valid Sharia excuse. So this is given the analogy, the Qiyas, in this situation that the fasts after the month of Ramadan, like in the month of Shawwal, will be valid. And the third situation that somebody fasts 
partly in Ramadan and partly before Ramadan, then the ones which are in Ramadan are accepted and the ones which are before Ramadan are not going to be accepted. And the fourth situation that partly the fast was in Ramadan and some of the fast was after Ramadan, then in this situation all of the fasting is going to be accepted. Okay. The author says, Babu Ahkam al Muftirina fi Ramadan. The chapter now pertaining to the situation of those who are able or not able, that's the wrong word, those who are allowed not to fast in Ramadan. Okay? So those who break their fast in Ramadan are of three categories, right? Al Muftirin. Those who break their fast are of three categories. First and foremost, those who are permitted not to fast, however, they must make up their fast later on. Okay? They're permitted not to fast, but they've got to make up their fast later on. This is like the sick person who is sick, but it's known or it's hoped that they're going to be cured soon. Okay? Or like the traveler, for example. The second of these categories is those who are permitted not to fast. They're allowed not to fast. However, they must pay a fidya. They must pay a compensation for the fact that they're not fasting. These are like the old person and the feeble person and the one who is sick with a sickness that is determined as being a non-curable sickness, an everlasting sickness. So these people, it's permissible for them not to fast. However, they have to pay a fidya, a compensation of feeding a sick person, uh, feeding uh, a fasting person for each day that they missed from the fasts. The third of these people who are allowed not to fast is the one that is ordered, commanded not to fast. However, must make up the fast later on. It is the one who is menstruating and the one who is uh, dealing with nifas, the postnatal bleeding. The author he says, It's permitted, it's permitted for four types of people in Ramadan to break their fast or not to fast. One of them, one of them is the sick who is harmed due to their sickness or is harmed due to fasting in their sickness. This is what it means. One of these categories from the four that the author is going to mention is a sick person who will be harmed uh, by fasting because of their sickness. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفْرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِّنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخْرَ That whoever is sick from amongst you or on a journey, then they do not have to fast, rather they can make up these fasts at a later date. Okay, so the harm with regards to the illness is that if you fast and you are sick, then your sickness will be prolonged or it will worsen. This is the determining factor with regards to should I fast or should I not fast. Okay, if you are sick. So if your illness is going to be prolonged due to your fasting or it's going to worsen, then in this situation, you should not fast, okay? Or we can say it's allowed for you not to fast. And the way you're going to know this is by speaking to a trustworthy doctor, okay? Or by trial and error uh, with this sickness previously in your life. Some of the ulama, they even said, even if it's the case that there is no real harm for you when you are fasting, uh, due to this sickness, it's not really going to increase you in harm. However, it's extremely difficult for you. It's in a state of difficulty, right? Then even in this situation, you are allowed not to fast and you can make up the fast at another date when you are feeling healthier. Imam Ahmed was asked about a person who had humma, the person who had fever. And uh, Imam Ahmed was asked, can this person who has a fever not fast? So the Imam, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said, وَمَا أَشَدْ مِنَ الْحُمَّةِ And what is there which is more severe than a fever? Meaning that of course a person in a situation of a strong fever has the permission not to fast. So in a nutshell, if a person is sick and by fasting this sickness is going to be prolonged or it's going to increase, okay, or the person is going to find real difficulty in fasting, then this person is permitted for them not to fast on that day Rather, they can make it up when they feel healthier and they feel stronger later on. Another category of people that do not have to fast in Ramadan, but they have to make it up later. The traveler who is traveling to an extent where they are allowed to shorten the prayers. Why? Because again, in the verse in the Quran, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَإِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ Surah Al-Baqarah, those from amongst you who are sick or are traveling, 
then they can make up their days at a later time. So the one who is traveling, there are certain conditions for this person to fit into the permission of not fasting. The first of them is that the distance has to be long enough wherein they are allowed to shorten their prayers. And that is the distance of a journey of 80 kilometers or more, okay? 80 kilometers or more from the city limits wherein the person leaves until the destination that they are traveling to. So if the journey is 80 kilometers or more from the city limits from where you are traveling to the destination that you're going to, then this is the first of the conditions to determine whether or not you are not, you, you are permitted not to fast, okay? The second of them, that the journey should be for a permissible reason. If it's for an impermissible reason, then the person is not permitted not to fast. Why? Because the Sharia doesn't allow one concessions for that which is going to lead to haram. So if, if we were to give the concession to a person who's journeying to, for a haram objective that they're journeying to a place because they want to go and party at a particular nightclub, then and we say to this person, you don't have to fast on your journey, this would be us encouraging the person or making it easy for the person to go ahead and not fast. So the concession is for the journey which is 80 kilometers or more from your city limits and for the journey which is permissible and the person on that journey mustn't intend to stay at their destination for four days or more. Mustn't intend to stay at the destination for four days or more. Okay, if the person intends to stay at the destination for four days or more, then as soon as the person reaches that destination, the concessions of the traveler, which is that you can shorten your prayer or you can choose not to fast, these are now removed, okay? The person has to behave as though they don't have that concession in this situation. The Hanbali scholars, they said it's better to take the rukhsa even if the person doesn't find it difficult. Rukhsa means concession. It's better to take the concession given to us even if we don't find it difficult to fast because in the hadith in Bukhari, Muslim from Jabir radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet said that it's not from righteousness to fast whilst traveling. And also in one of the narrations, the Prophet said, Upon you is the concession which Allah has given you, meaning take it, the concession which Allah has given to you from His mercy. However, again, the scholars, the humble scholars, they say pertaining to this, that the one who starts that the, this concession pertains to the one who starts a journey, starts fasting whilst on the journey. These concessions are for the one who starts fasting whilst in the journey, okay? In or on the journey. However, the one that started fasting whilst they were a resident, they started fast, fasting before they became a traveler, then it's disliked for this person to break the fast unless it becomes extremely difficult. Also, the one who knows that they will reach their destination before the sun has set on that given day, then again, it's dislike for them to break their fast. So the concession is for the one, okay, who starts fasting whilst on a journey. But the one who starts fasting whilst they were a resident, before they were a traveler, it's disliked for them. It's not haram, it's disliked for them to break their fast. Also, the one who knows that they will reach their destination before Maghrib, it's dislike for them to start their fast. The author says, فَالْفِطَرْ لَهُمَا أَفْضَلْ In this situation, the situation of the sick that we described and the situation of the traveler that we described, then for them not to fast is better, it's preferred for them. وَعَلَيْهُمْ الْقَضَاءُ And upon them is that they make up the fast at a later date. وَإِنْ صَامَ أَجْزَأْهُمَا However, if they were to fast, then their fasting will be valid for them. As long as there is no harm upon them. If there was harm upon them, then it would be haram for them to fast. Allah says, don't kill yourself, don't harm yourselves to that extent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful upon you. And the Prophet said in the hadith, لا درر ولا درر, that there is no harming and there is no reciprocating of harm. So in the Sharia, we're not allowed to do things, even if it's an act of worship, if it brings harm to us, okay, in a variety of ways. So the author is saying it's permissible for you if you're sick and you're traveling to fast, as long as it doesn't harm you. The third category of people who it's allowed for them not to fast, Al-Ha'id wa Nufasa. 
is the one who is menstruating and the one who is in the situation of postnatal bleeding. Tuftirani wa taqdiyani. These two, they uh, don't fast or they break their fast. Uh, they don't fast and they make up the fasts at a later date. Some of the scholars, when they looked at this phrase of the author, when he said it's, per it's permitted for the menstruating woman and the one who is in the state of nifast, the one who is in the state of postnatal bleeding, to not fast and they make it up later. Some of the scholars, they found a problem with the statement. Can anybody think what the problem with the statement could be? So we're saying that it's, uh, yani it's permitted, okay, mubah, it's permitted for the woman who is menstruating to not fast. And some of the scholars, they found a problem with the statement. Any idea what the problem could be? Okay, the problem with this statement is that exactly as the sister just mentioned or the brother, I'm not sure, on the thing, on the chat, that you are not meant to fast. It's obligatory upon you not to fast. So the scholars, they said, why did the author fit this with the other categories where he said it's mubah, that it's permitted for you not to fast. Rather here, it's an oblig it's obligation. You're commanded not to fast. And if you were to fast knowingly, you would be sinful, okay? So the ha'id person, she's not to fast and she's to make it up because in the hadith of Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Mu'ada radiallahu anha, she said, Sa'altu Aisha radiallahu anha, I asked our mother, the mother of the believers Aisha, ma ba'al ha'id taqti salah wa la taqti salah. What is the situation pertaining to the menstruating woman? She makes up the fasting days, right? But she doesn't make up the praise that she missed. So Aisha, she said, she said, ahawruriyatun anti, are you from those misguided group? Of people that you're asking this type of question she said let's to be said no I'm not from that misguided Khawarij group but I'm asking so Aisha radiallahu anha she said she said that used to fall upon us in the time of the Prophet وسلم, meaning that we used to menstruate and we were commanded to make up the fasts and not commanded to make up the prayers okay so that is the proof for the points that we mentioned Okay, some important points pertaining to the menstruative woman when fasting. The first of them, the woman whose blood stops after Fajr, she, her menstruating blood stops some moments after Fajr. She's not allowed to consider that day as a valid fast. Why? Because she didn't make a firm intention that she would fast on that day because she didn't know when her blood was going to stop. So it wasn't possible for her to make a firm intention before the Fajr of that day to fast. So her fasting, even though it stopped only a few moments after Fajr, is not permissible for her to fast that day. However, she has to make imsak, she has to withhold as though she was fasting for the rest of that day due to the sanctity of the month, right? Though now her menstruating blood has stopped after Fajr, she has to continue the day without eating and drinking or sexual intercourse, right? Uh, due to the sanctity of the month, even though her fought, she can't fast on that particular day and she has to make that day up. Day. Also, if a woman stops bleeding after Fajr, sorry, if a woman stops bleeding before Fajr, even by a few moments and she's able to make the intention, though she hasn't made a ghusl, she's allowed to go and fast that day. Why? Because she's, the thing which is preventing her from fasting, the man has been removed, which is the blood of menstruation. And she had enough time to make an intention for the fasting before the time of Fajr came in. And also the third thing, that the ghusl, the purification bath for her, is not an obligatory thing upon her for fasting, right? It's not something which she has to have done before she starts her fast. طيب, a third matter pertaining to the menstruation of women is that if a woman is confused as to when her bleeding started. She's confused, did it start at this time or that time? Okay, then the rule is that the ruling is given to the second of the two times. So for example, if a woman is confused, did my bleeding start before Maghrib or did it start after Maghrib on a day from the days of Ramadan? We said that the ruling is that it is given to the second of the two times. So this woman who's confused, she's not sure, did the bleeding start before Maghrib or after Maghrib? We say your bleeding started after Maghrib and therefore your fasting of that day is valid. And this rule was mentioned by Sheikh Abdul Salam al in his explanation of Zad al-Mustaqna. 
the author he said in Samata Lam Yudzihuma and if they go ahead and they fast, then their fasting is not going to be valid for them, meaning the menstruating woman or the woman who is facing uh, postnatal bleeding is not going to be valid because why? Because it's um, they were commanded not to fast. They were commanded to abstain from fasting. Okay? Dave, we'll stop here inshallah because time has caught up with us and I'm sure we've taken a bit of information that needs to be reviewed by you all. I hope I didn't make it too complicated. Whatever was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan. And these matters are fundamentally important for us to know. The fiqh of Ramadan so we can teach ourselves, we can teach our families and we can teach our loved ones inshallah. And also it's an act of worship uh, which is coming upon us and it's imperative that before we do any act of worship, we have some fundamental knowledge pertaining to that, inshallah. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward us all for this uh, short um, act of worship that we have just done.